Good evening and welcome to another chat with Andrew. Thank you for joining. Thank you for watching this video. I would like also for you to subscribe and to share my videos. Remember now that it takes quite a bit of effort uh, to produce and to make these videos, right? It's not an easy task. You know, it's easy to watch them, right? And it's easy to critique them, to criticize people's videos, but it's very, very hard work behind the scenes. You know, I've always listened to content creators, you know, those who are on YouTube, YouTube influencers, and they've always talked about the fact that it is indeed a very difficult task to make the videos. I thought that it was simple to be in your home and, you know, just produce a video. You sit before the camera, and you talk, right? And they like to do their pranks and whatever things they do. Um, however, it is much more engaging than you can imagine. First of all, you have to get your things set up. Sometimes you have glitches, challenges, and you also have to be in the frame of mind. You also have to be comfortable with the camera, something that I'm trying to get accustomed to, uh, to doing. I am particularly comfortable, for example, teaching online, but I am not comfortable with always recording myself and listening to myself. This is something that I've never thought of doing. Um, but, you know, as I do it, I think I am beginning to get a little bit more comfortable with this important task. If you had told me years ago that I would be making YouTube videos, I would laugh at you, right? Because, you know, there was no way from my perspective that I was going to be engaged um, on sitting before a camera talking to people. Um, but this is a great platform to air and to articulate uh, things that matter, important issues that we have been talking about. Now, tonight I was going to talk to you about uh, the war zones in the U.S. in terms of, we can see now where the universities, and not only the universities per se, but even the kindergartens going up to university, the K through to K-12 and the university campuses are becoming awash with um, sort of, they, they're, they have protest actions on these universities. And we find we are hearing that the Biden presidency are he well the administration is suggesting that there is pervasive anti-Semitism being demonstrated on these campuses. So think about that a seven-year-old or an eight-year-old or nine-year-old could be expressing uh sentiments that uh that indicate or demonstrate, you know, anti-Semitism. I find that a very difficult to understand and to believe. However, we understand that parents, sometimes when they speak, uh, their children hear what they say and sometimes they might imitate them and might, of course, articulate sentiments heard and learned at home. Very important that parents understand the world in which they're living right now and begin to educate their children. We're not living in normal times now, so you cannot begin to protect your child and become overly sensitive and protective. You've got to understand that this world is dangerous and we're not living in the era of freeness and free expression, liberty as we were accustomed to before. Um, even before 2019, before the COVID-19 pandemic. We're living in a, in a society now where in which, you know, if you say something, you can be deemed as a terrorist, something that is not officially sanctioned or permitted by our governments. This is very, very concerning. But, you know, this is it is what it is. And we have to be able to accept that we are living in these very uh, troublesome times. You know, um, Ellen White, and she was uh, co-founder of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, had mentioned 
years ago that the final movements would be rapid ones. And we can see where now the agencies of evil are consolidating their forces and they're moving rapidly, much more quickly than we can imagine. If we can recall a, during the COVID-19 pandemic, it came upon us rapidly, right? So quickly that we were astonished when they told us to all go in our homes and lock down, right? Uh, this was something that we weren't accustomed to doing. And when the government finally told us that we had to do it, and if we didn't do it, then we would be arrested because that was the law, that was a mandate. By the way, you know, uh, talking about law and mandate, of course, a, a mandate is not a law. And that is a sentiment that is always um, said by people on the political right, you know? And I say, I agree. Fundamentally, it is not, right? A mandate is different from a law. However, that is for a democratic society. If you're living in a democratic society, definitely mandates are not laws. But when the governments and our governments are morphing into the tyrannical, dictatorial governments that we're seeing right now, they are going to be considered as laws, right? And we saw that happening during the pandemic. If you did not comply with government stipulations and their suggestions and recommendations and their mandates, you could face the consequences of the law, right? And many people lost their jobs, right? Um, so we have to be mindful of these situations. Today, um, tonight I should say, I just put up an article. I'm not gonna talk about what's happening at the university campuses uh, across the United States and not only the university campuses, but all academics, academic centers in which um, we are seeing the proliferation of anti-Semitism. Um, anti whatever that means. <laughs> Notice that, you know, right now we're having this word used very, very lightly, the word anti. So if I disagree with you, it means that I am anti. So for example, I am Seventh-day Adventist. If, you should, if I'm talking to somebody and they do not agree with Seventh-day Adventist doctrines and beliefs, then I say that they're anti. No, not agreeing with someone and saying that, you know, you might find the religion not to be to your um, taste, to your religious taste, does not necessarily mean that you are anti semitic It's just that you don't agree with them. And you might not find their, you know, brand of religion agreeable with your ideologies and with your fundamental beliefs. And that is okay, because that is how a democratic society should be. Should, should be organized. Remember now, when the Protestant Reformation happened, the, the churches, the, the, of course, the Catholic Church was the only church that existed during that during the time of the Dark Ages. And when the, the Protestant Reformation started and it, it took place, you, you saw a proliferation of different denominations. People were morphing into different denominations. Like you had the Methodists, you had the Baptists, right? The Presbyterians, right? You had first the Lutherans, you know, and stuff like that. So that was the standard of what um, freedom of expression was all about. So the, the whole idea of freedom of expression has a religious foundation. Right, and that is why we have so many denominations in the world right now. And they, and guess what? <laughs> they are reading the same Bible, and you're saying, "How is it?" Because they interpret their interpretation of the Bible is different. Now, not because I don't agree with a Lutheran, am I anti-Lutheran, or because I I don't agree with the Catholics, it means that I'm anti-Catholic. Right? We must not use these words because it's heavy when you say somebody's anti. It's almost like the way in which they are expressing that sort of sentiment, it's almost like you want to hurt the person. You are a, a terrorist. It's just like, you know, the whole medical invention uh, medicine that they wanted to give us. You know, I'm trying to stay away from the use of a certain word. Um, you know, if you did not take that particular uh, prescription or medicine, 
you were regarded as being anti that medicine. But no, if I do not think aspirin works well for me, I don't think that I'm anti-aspirin. It's just that it doesn't work well for me. And I would prefer not to have it. Now, let's go on to the discussion at hand. You know, the last time, you know, I don't, not the last time, but I think on Saturday, was it? Saturday, uh, I think that was my video number three. And I think that video was entitled, Is the US a Democracy? And I just put up this article, I just finished reading it, and I thought that I would share it with you guys because it has a lot of parallels and similar sentiments to what Chalmers suggested in his book. So shall we, let me pull up that article, let me share my screen with you right now, and I will pull that article up. All right, let me close this here. And yeah, so here we are seeing this article and this was published by a magazine called Descent. <laughs> I love that word, Descent, because we need more Descent right now, right? We, we, we're, we are assenting to too many things that our governments are doing, right? Things that are not necessarily in the best interest of the populace. Here we have this article, A Short History of American Empire. Where we talk about empire, and we said essentially that you cannot be a democratic society and be an empire at the same time. The two doesn't work. You can't have your cake and eat it at the same time. It's either you are democratic, you are a democracy, or you are an empire. And the United States has opted for the latter. And that is what um, she is. Now, it's remember now too, that the goals and the objectives and the agendas of ordinary Americans are different from the goals and the objectives of the government, um, generally speaking. So I don't want people to attack me and say I'm attacking Americans because Americans are great people, right? And, you know, wonderful people to talk with. They are generally hospitable and just a caring, sympathetic group of people. So we're not talking about the the common man, the, 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 the populace, the citizens, the civilians, we're talking about the leaders within government. And we also do not want to lump all the leaders into one camp, because remember now that you have a few. I would, I would you know, hasten to say that they are not in the majority, but you have a few in the minority. So we have to respect um, the leaders, the American leaders who are fighting as much as they can to uphold the Constitution of the United States of America. We applaud them, we applaud their efforts, and we continue to pray for them. Now, another thing is that God enjoins upon all of us to respect our governments because he uses them as sometimes a form of punishment for our behavior. Because remember now that people like sometimes we complain about our governments, but the governments come from us and they share a lot of the values sometimes which are not wholesome that we practice, right? So we have to also be mindful of that, that we're getting sometimes the leaders that we deserve. And that is why we have to educate our minds and ourselves and be aware of some of the things that we know that we know when we have a just leader and when we have a leader that is unjust. Now, if you look at this picture here, we're seeing Madeleine um, Albright, and she was the former Secretary of State under the Bill Clinton's administration. Um, so this was perhaps a photo taken sometime in the 19th. Maybe, you know, I don't know when this was taken because I'm seeing John Kerry here and Hillary Clinton um, here also. Now, these people are looking very distinguished, right? And we tend to look at people and we like to see that people are well-dressed and they look very distinguished. Um, and that is, we have to be careful about just looking at people's, the exterior, uh, at people's exterior and not looking at, you know, well, we can't look at their heart, but we have to look at their fruits. We have to look at what they did. Now, I want to share a brief 
little thing with you about Madeline. Um, am I pronouncing her name correctly? Perhaps not. Hopefully I, I am. Uh, here we have an article written by, um, his name is uh, Ahmed Tuaj. I hope I'm also pronouncing his. And he says, let's remember Madeline Albright for who she really was. And he's giving here now an introduction of who she was. The former U.S. Secretary of State, who once publicly admitted that she thinks the deaths of half a million Iraqi children were worth it, was no force for democracy and human rights. So here is a lady who was the Secretary of State of the United States, you know, because under the Clinton administration, let's go back to history. Remember now that when they had the Desert Storm, the they, uh, they in intervention there in Iraq during the first um, war that they had in the United States, when the United States went over there, uh, that, you know, afterwards when Bill Clinton came into office in 1992-93, you know, um, and I think it might have been um, later in the administration that he imposed sanctions on, on Iraq, right? And that was done while Madeleine Albright was under in his administration. She says, um, the, 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 the question was asked her, what does she, what did she think? Because she's now deceased, right? What did she think about those sanctions and their, the, the effects that it had on children particularly? She says, we have heard that half a million Iraqi children have died. I mean, that is more children than died in Hiroshima asked um, Stahl. So the question is being asked her, what does she think? And you know, is the price worth it? And this is how she responded, you know, when, you know, the journalist was asking her if the price was worth it in terms of the sanctions being placed on uh, on these, uh, on Iraq and the fact that it had a, a terrible, cons uh, terrible consequence on the children. She says, I think that is a very hard choice, Albright answered. But the price, we think the price is worth it. Now, if you know, I think over 500,000 children died as a result of the sanctions in Iraq. That, that sanctions happened between, I think it was 1996 and 2000, um, between those years. And she was not particularly sorry, apologetic for the sanctions that were imposed by the United States of America. You know, one of the things that I always say, it seems to me that as a people, we tend to forget history. And for example, when the pandemic came about and the, the governments of the world were saying that they were so interested in saving lives, I was a bit curious, you know, because with all the wars that we have waged um, around the world, not only the U.S. government, we're not only looking now at in terms of wars, because other countries have also waged wars and other governments have also killed their people. Um, I have never seen that care and that sympathy on the part of governments. When we think about also the way how they manage the economies sometimes, and the fact that they have sometimes, you know, hundreds of thousands of people starving around the world. Um, while some of the governments, you know, they are, they have enriched themselves from the resources of the people. How could they convince me that they were so caring and they were very concerned about the number of deaths from COVID? I just could not believe it, you know? And perhaps again, I am a bizarre thinker. Now, let's go into this article. It's a very, very important article, and I want to get these points out very quickly before I end this video. Now, this I think this is a this is a review of a book written by Stephen Kinzer, right? And I think he might have been a writer for the New York Times. And 
But the, 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 the title of this piece is A Short History of American Empire. I think uh, Stephen Kinzer, let me, he has the introduction here. Stephen Kinzer is one of the few mainstream voices reminding Americans of our imperial identity. Right, so it's an identity. America is indeed an empire, whether we like it or not. In the true flag, I think this is the title of the book that Stephen Kinzer has written. He takes us back to where he thinks it all began in 1898, when the U.S. political class pushed off on the quest for global domination. Now, remember now that a lot of things were happening in 1898, and you know, we're not going to give that historic um, context and, you know, lesson uh, at this point, because I need to get through this, this, um, this article. Toward the end of his history of the domestic conflict over U.S. overseas expansion at close of the 19th century, Stephen Kinzer notes that the winners permanently changed our political lexicon. All right, so the political lexicon was changed Right. And, you know, when we say lexicon, you're using words, right? Imperialists became open hearted, visionary globalists and internationalists. So these are the words that they were using when they talk, when they use the word globalists. All of these are or internationalists is the same as imperialists. Right. And when you hear them saying now that we also have to be multilateral and we need a multilateral approach, it's the same thing. <laughs> right? It's the same thing as being, or if it's unilateral also, it's the same thing that they are empires. And that is why there is essentially no difference between the Republican Party and the Democratic Party, because they all use language. But the lexicon varies, right, from one party to the next, but it is all about just the uh, rhetoric and not anything of substance. There is no real fundamental difference, I would say. Anti-imperialists became crabby, reactionary, isolationists. As applied to the United States, the words empire and imperialism virtually disappeared. The muddling of the language has made it easier for Americans to misunderstand just what it is that we are doing out there in the world. Thus, in the late 2013, and I want you to listen to this, because this is recent history right now, at a time when Barack Obama's foreign policy was widely criticized in the United States as too soft, a Gallup poll, uh, sorry, a Gallup poll, I'm correct, of around 65,000 people in 65 countries showed that the United States was considered the greatest threat to world peace. Pakistan was a distant second. Right. So this is a Gallup poll that was done and it's suggested here. Right. It, re it has revealed that 65,000 people in 65 countries showed that the United States was considered the greatest threat to world peace. Now, this is something that the New York, the New York Times might not be and the Washington Post and the Los Angeles Times, I'm sure that they are not necessarily bringing the, the sort of discussion to the fore. The story we tell ourselves, of course, is that we are the guardians of the peace, besieged by forces of evil that hate us because of our unique national virtues of freedom, tolerance, and democracy. So all of this is what we call propaganda at its highest, at its best. The possibility that we are being attacked here in San Bernardino, um, uh, Orlando or Boston, because we are bombing there in Afghanistan, Iraq or Yemen, lies beyond the current intellectual capacity of our public discourse. Yet, what word better than empire describes America's role among nations? We have at least 800 acknowledged, some of them might be unacknowledged, military installations around the world, the most extensive imperium in history. Now, I like to say this because, you know, the most extensive imperium in history, this, this, this is really, really 
found here and something that we need to take stock of. You know, there are people who will say, for example, that the Bible does not talk about the United States of America. Now, how could you think that God would have put, you know, Babylon, Medo Persia, Greece, Rome, all of these powerful empires, mighty empires, look at Rome, powerful empire, yet still, in terms of its imperium, the United States of, you know, outweighs it, it's, it's, it's superior to that empire. It's unthinkable. God definitely would have to mention and did mention if you read Revelation 13 um, about this empire and the lamb-like beast and what it would be doing in the world. I, I think one of these days I'm going to do a presentation on this channel on Revelation 13 to show you compelling evidence that the United States is in fact um, spoken about in the Bible and that God would not have overlooked such a very, very important and influential country in the world. In 2016, U.S. Special Operations Forces, Commanders, Navy SEALs, Green Barrets were deployed in 138 countries. In many foreign capitals, the most important figure is the U.S. ambassador, right? Means therefore that that person there runs the show, right? And so it's very, very disheartening sometimes when I speak to people and they think that, oh, you know, you know, this guy is speaking baloney, right? He's a lunatic. How can he think that Jamaica or Trinidad or Guyana uh, is not are not independent nations, that they are controlled by outside factors. And I'm not saying that to some extent, they do not have some form of autonomy, right? But, you know, important issues, important matters um, are not necessarily solved by them for want of, you know, a better word. They are not necessarily in control of the major decisions that are taken in these countries, right? We are the globe's biggest military spenders by far and sell as many weapons of war as the rest of the world's arms traffickers combined, right? And this is serious because we have a time where the U.S. is, uh, you know, the economy uh, is indebted but yet still it has money to send to spend on these weapons, right? Weapons of war, because war is profitable, as I told you in the previous video. True, we haven't won a war against a substantial military force since 1945, but we haven't had to, and this is a very important point, that the United States does, is not going there necessarily to win, it's going there to control. Remember we talked about the the, uh, the Latin derivative of the word empire, and we say that it's coming from the word imperium or imperium, right? Which means what? To control. We, we look also at the, the infinitive of, from which that word was derived in Latin, and it was imperare, imperare, which means to dominate or to control. Right, So this is what it does. It's not there to teach. It's not there to negotiate. It's not there to do things diplomatically. It is there to control. And this is what we have to understand. Once established, empires do not have to definitively win the wars on their periphery. Get that in mind because sometimes we say, "Why is the U.S. stopped, you know, folding arms and coming back home? They're not winning the war, you know, and stuff like that." But they don't have to win the war, right? They're not there sometimes to win the war. If they win, you know, that would be good. And they don't want to win the war too because if you win the war, it, it ends, and you know, then all of that money is going to be um, is is going to vanish, right? All that money is going to vanish. So you keep a war so the 
the, the, the dollars can keep flowing, keep flowing into the coffers, into the major coffers. And that's what it's all about. All right. You must understand that if, if, if this is something, this is the only thing that I have, you know, talked about in the video, uh, I think this is something that you need to, to take stock of. And you need to commit to your memory so that you can remember now that this is not about winning wars. This is about expanding wars, you know, so that you can keep the flow of money coming. Rather, the central task is to demonstrate their willingness and capacity to inflict murderous punishment on those who rebel. Right? And so another, you know, another reason for which they go to war is that they also like to show who is in control. You know, it's a bully, and bullies do that, right? People, bullies like to say, I'm controlling, you must listen to me. If you don't listen to me, then you must face the consequences because bullies always have to prove themselves, the sort of masculine, um, you know, sort of behavior um, or disposition. Now, since 2001, we have attacked 14 different countries. Uh, imperialism's default, foreign uh, so let me imperialism's default, foreign policy is limited but endless war. Now, here at home, the authoritarian politics needed to accommodate empire are firmly in place among both the leaders and the land. Right? So remember now we say that the actions of the imperium will eventually return home, right? So Americans who sit there watching their televisions, watching football and basketball, thinking that the war in between Palestine, the, 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 the Palestinians and the Israelis, you know, it's just a war out there. It's thousands of miles away from our shores. But the tactics, often the brutal tactics um, used in these wars will ultimately be um, exported back, will return home. The, the similar tactics will be used on the American people, right? Congress has long surrendered to the executive branch its constitutional duty to decide whether or not to go to war. So Congress is no longer um, the body that decides whether, even though that is a part of the constitution that Congress should declare war, but it's no longer fulfilling that obligation. Because remember we, we, the last time we spoke or in video number three, I, I told you that the, the US, the, all the presidents, they occupy what we call an imperial office. They are essentially the imperial president. That's what they really are. It doesn't matter if it's Trump or if it's Biden or if it's Obama or if it's Bush. They, they represent this the, the 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 large empire that we um, call America. So they're not necessarily representing the interest of the common man because that's what Congress is there to do, right? To, to represent the people, right? But uh, at this point in time, that is history. It's no longer the reality today. At a time when the U.S. electorate holds virtually all other institutions in contempt, and I want you to listen to this very carefully, the military is revered. A study from Harvard and the University of Melbourne reports that the share of Americans who think that rule by the armed forces would be a good or very good thing rose from 1 in 16 in 1995 to 1 in 6 in 2014. It means, therefore, that more Americans are more accepting of a military dictatorship than we think. Okay. Now, how could this be happening in a country that prides itself of having some of the best and the most prestigious universities in the world. Right? Great books, some you know of the greatest books I've written that, that I've read, sorry, have come from that country. How could people 
accept this sort of um you know this this sort of behavior this sort of of thinking how could you think that a military is going to give you freedom or is going to protect your freedom let's move on with the election of donald trump the misuse of language to obscure the reality of imperialism has reached a new height, or the, has reached new heights, he's saying here. But the practice extends, sorry, but the practice extends beyond the mindless babble of our infantile president. After he sent missiles to bomb Syria, the front page of the New York Times referred to Trump, global cap capitalist, defender of dictators, and blustering champion of US military expansion as an isolationist. <laughs> no, this, this is really, really a joke, right? So here is this imperial president doing all that imperial presidents do, but the Washington, the, the New York Times is playing this sort of politics by saying that he's an isolationist. But remember now that the word the isolationist is really going to be, it still doesn't matter. They are still. Um, imperialist, even though they say that they are. And I think he's going to explain that these terminologies mean nothing. They are the same. Um, they are just rhetoric being used uh, to divide the American populace to believe that one is isolationist and the other is um, multilateralist, right? Um, and global in their perspective. And how many people on the left think that America wants to engage the other world. They want to get rid of racism. They want to get rid of transphobia and all of these phobias in the world. At the end of the day, do they really want to get rid of these phobias? Or are they trying to divide us so that they can conquer us? I think that the latter is true. Our foreign policy debates, hard power versus soft power, realism versus values, military versus diplomacy, unilateralism, unilateralism, unilateralism sorry, versus multilateralism do not reflect opposing philosophical view ideas on how Americans should relate to the world. They are disputes over the best way to reinforce our self-appointed role of policeman, jury, and judge of the global order. The Democratic Cup may have a less, and I want you to hear this, I want you to listen to this, and I want you to read it as and follow what the, the logic that this guy is making here, because it's very important. The Democratic Cup may have a less belligerent personality than the Republican Cup. Notice that here that they're both cops, right? They are, yeah, that's what they are. They're not Democratic. They're there to shoot if they need to shoot and they will kill. But as he's mentioning here, bo but both will shoot to kill when their authority is threatened. Right? So both the Republican Party and the Democratic Party will kill if you challenge their authority. Stephen Kinzer, former foreign correspondent for the New York Times, has long been one of the few voices reminding Americans of our imperial identity. Over the years, he has written a series of accessible and fast-paced histories of the United States, less than benign interventions in other countries' domestic policies, politics rather, including the violent overthrow of elected governments in Chile, Iran, and Guatemala. And it's important that you, you be reminded of these uh, governments, these democratic governments that were overthrown, that were deposed in Latin America, and a whole host of other countries, including Jamaica also, um, when the CIA intervened in the Manly's administration. So th there's a lot of things happening, and Americans have to uh, dedicate, they have to find some time to read. I think we need to start turning off the televisions and get good books and read them. And by the way, we we're talking about also censorship and the lack of freedom of expression or the restriction, I should say, because we don't, we still have some, there's still some freedom of, of expression, but it's, it's being restricted. 
eventually will will lose it. But while it's while some opportunity is there to read and to read good books, we need to do that because very soon books also will be censored. And I, I think already some books have been censored, including uh so I think we need to find time. I know that we're working, I know that's you know, many of us are have to work over time and many hours you know, to survive because of what's happening in these um, economies. Um, but I would encourage all of you, including myself, to find the time necessary to read and to read good books, not to read fictitious books. Now, we don't have time to read fictitious books. Even your children don't have time to read fictitious books. They must read you know, books, history books, books that are talking about reality. Um, because at this time, I, I don't think the the the, the um the, the the stories, the you know, the fictitious stories are going to help us to understand the world in which we live. I mean, if you have a base in the reality, then you know you can sometimes some fictional books might have additional information that you know that they might share with you but you also have to be rooted and grounded in the facts before you'll be able to um analyze and to critique those sort of fictitious books and their works in his latest the, the true flag he takes us back to where he thinks it all began the years uh 1898 1901 when the u.s political class pushed us off on the quest for global domination up to that point, U.S. foreign policy generally adhered to the founding fathers' pres prescription against entangling alliances. As John Quincy Adams put it, Americans should not be tempted to go uh, abroad in search of monsters to destroy. Otherwise, he feared, although America might become the, the, the dictatress of the world, she would be no longer the ruler of her own spirit. So the, the 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 constitution and the constitution rather and the values of America um are not compatible or is not compatible, all right? The, the constitution is not compatible, um, and the values are not compatible, <laughs> I should say, with the with globalism and with internationalism, with imperialism, right? They cannot they are just not compatible. They can't live in the same room, right? So Americans have to make up their minds, at least the citizens, the governments have already, the government has so surely made up its mind already that they are moving in that direction. And, that's ha and that has been happening for decades as we can see here um, from 1898, that has been in the works. Right, they have already made up their decision, and I think that is why Chalmers is saying that at this point, because most Americans have not been aware of what was happening or what is happening, it's I think the Imperium has reached a certain point where it's not you cannot they cannot regress, they it's not it's going to be hard to uh return to the days of. The, a constitutional problem, right? This is very hard to accept, but it is the point. Now, um, Kinzer presents the argument between Roosevelt and Twain, that is Mark Twain, as a struggle for America's political soul. These adver um, adversaries, were deliciously matched. Their views of life, freedom, duty, and the nature of human happiness could not have been further apart. While Roosevelt considered colonialism a form of Christian charity, Twain pictured Christendom as a majestic matron in flowing robes drenched in blood. So here, you know, Mark Twain was very critical of the American empire. He was before, you know, I think, you know, as an American, he was, Pro empire. Well, America was never an empire before. Well, you know, before that eighteen ninety eight, or you know, never expressed that desire. Even though we could say to some extent that they were a continental power because our continental continental empire. Because when you think of the fact that 
the Indians were displaced, then you had the the uh, the Mexicans and you know, and then you know, Hawaii and all these Guam and so forth. You know, you can say that America, it was like a continental empire to a large extent. And you know, it was, you know, I, I recently learned some years ago, I should say, that you know, even during slavery, you know, um, before the Civil War in the United States, that it was the the, the planters, the, the U.S. planters, the slave planters, they wanted to expand their slave, you know, empire, I should say, because it was in fact an empire, um, but the, they wanted to expand the plantocracy to, to Cuba, right? It was in the works, right? Because um, because that is what they they were thinking that they would ev eventually expand it to, to, to other parts of America and become uh, a big slave plantocracy. Perhaps, you know, they, that, that's what they they wanted to control the entire American continent. Um, now they are controlling the world, not just the American continent, but the entire globe. Um, the anti-imperialist position was also a mixture of class and parties. It included Robert Barron, Andrew Carnegie, Carnegie um, Carnegie, his name is labor leader, uh, Samuel um, Gumpers, African American educator, Booker T. Washington, social worker. And now let's let me go down to the 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 uh, the important points. I I think you have I think I've made some important points, and I don't think I want to read the entire thing be for you. But I think I should zero in in this here. All right, let, let's 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 go to this paragraph. So empire became its own justification, might made right, which then rationalized more, more might. As Bill Clinton's UN ambassador and and and, and she was Madeleine Albright as we um she was first the UN ambassador and then she became Secretary of State. And later Secretary of State Madeleine Albright famously asked General Colin Powell What's the point of having the superb or this superb military you're always talking about if we can't use it, right? So even Albright was very, very proud of the military, the American military going around the world and killing people, you know? This is something that we have to contend with, the killing of innocent lives. Because it's going to come back to haunt us. Remember now that when slavery was happening in the United States and around the world, many of the planters and the and the European people who lived, you know, in those eras, they thought it was just only going to happen to you know, to, 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 to people of African descent, to, to African slaves, right? They never knew that a civil war was on its way. And many of them also died as a result of the civil war. Many of these white people who thought they were safe, right? Because slavery was only for black people. And Americans, on the other hand, might think that these wars are being waged outside of the United States and they're killing people. It's not me. I'm in my house. I'm safe, right? I'm living this high standard of living. I don't care, right? But what happens when it comes to you? Because it will come to you. But as Chalmers also intimated, empires do not last forever. Nothing lasts forever. And this is what we have to understand. Right? It, it amazes me. Today I was watching a clip um, of an interview, you know, with an interview on... Uh, with with uh, it was an interview with what's his name George Soros, 
And, you know, George Soros is this billionaire, as you guys know, and, you know, but he's, a, he's, a, he's an elderly person now, he's an elderly man. And when I saw that he could barely pronounce his words, he was, you know, barely could talk, barely could articulate his sentiments. You look at how fragile human beings are. Why do we engage in these wars? Why do we kill people around the world? when we know that we too one day will die. You know, what's the satisfaction? You know, it's it's just, you know, we just have to say that that's, it's diabolic, it's demonic, because there's no other explanation. I mean, our lives are so short, right? You know, as the songwriter says, like, you know, we, 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 we blossom and flourish like leaves on the tree, but wither and, uh, but, you know, and we wither and perish but not changeth the immortal invisible. That song, love that hymn, the immortal and invisible God. Already, our hours shows signs of overreach. The American model of client colonialism depends on the capacity of Washington to bribe and subsidize enough of the world's politicians and generals to keep them loyal. So we see where you know, they bribe politicians, they pay them off and um, to get what they want to get done. So whether it's an economic um, package through the IMF, through the World Bank, you know, and they, the, 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 uh, the politicians will sell the IMF program to you and say it's a wonderful program. And, uh, um, but at the end of the day, it will impoverish the nation, but they are being paid. So they work very hard and they accomplish what these multilateral organizations require them to do. But US economic power is eroding. And this, he's talking here from 2017, remember this article was written in 2017. In an increasing number of places, it is the Chinese, not the Americans, who now have the cash, All right? So America is just operating on credit, right? They don't have, the level of liquidity that we think she has, right? That our country needs to adjust to a multipolar world has become a cliche among foreign policy pundits. But our depart or bipartisan policy class, all right, fiercely protective of its unipolar privileges. Are you getting it? that while they say that they want a multipolar world, we're hearing from the Democrats, we want a multipolar world, we want to work with China, and we want to work, well, they don't want to work with China because even the Democrats are, are aggressive towards China, right? But, you know, they, they, they often use these rhetoric and they often blame the Republicans that they're too isolationist and, you know, you guys need to be much more globalistic um, in your in your approach and in your vision, right, of the world. Now, this is very important, though, has shown little interest in backing away from its global commitments. The Democratic foreign policy team of Obama, Clinton, Kerry deferred with the Bush, Cheney, Rumsfeld team on operational grounds, right? So Justin, yeah, but from the Persian Gulf to the South China Sea, they maintained and arguably extended U.S. military obligations. So it doesn't matter who's in the office, right? And as much as Trump talks about he's not, you know, he has not gone to war and um, America should get out of, um, you know, wars. Remember that, that Trump during the pandemic was trying to invade Venezuela. I think that that is something that is not spoken about often, but he tried, he didn't succeed, <laughs> right? But he did try, okay? So Trump is, he might not have such a lot of wars, um, you know, we can say, but we don't know if he had remained in office for an, another term, if he would have. Remember now that he was, you know, three years into his presidency, we had the pandemic and then, his entire, you know, um, tenure was was being derailed or was derailed. 
Now, Trump, despite his querulousness about Europe's uh, insufficient dues to NATO and his admiration for Putin and other shady characters, represents a continuation of the commitment to world he hegemony of his predecessors. Right, So he was committed to expanding the military industrial complex. He has already backed off the protectionist promises he made to working class voters and wants to expand foreign arms sales to create jobs, jobs, jobs. Because jobs come from the military industrial complex too, right? There, it, there is, you know, some sort of benefits that come from it. And they do provide lots of jobs and, you know, some of which are well-paid paid jobs too. He is increasing the already bloated defense budget and has loosened the civilian leash on the Pentagon's power to initiate military action. The danger of a Trump presidency is from the opposite of isolationism and expansion of US aggression around the world. As the Romans learned, if you build an empire, sooner or later, you get a paranoid crackpot for emperor. <laughs> Remember now that Chalmers did say, you know, or he did pose the question, I should say, that, you know, in which he asked, you know, will, will the United States eventually morph, you know, my words, into a military dictatorship? And when January the 6th, 2000, was it 21? When, it, when that happened, I thought that that was the... You know, it, it was like, you know, an experiment um, of how that could take place. Right? And sometimes these things happen, it doesn't happen out of thin air. You know, there are just too many things happening that people say, oh, these are coincidences. You know, it's just a coincidence. You know, can so many things happen that just the mere coincidence? Got to think, got to put two and two. We're not suggesting here that this is what happened, but you've got to, you can't deny the fact that that could be a possibility. And this is what I always say to people. They, you know, they think that because you don't have the hard evidence, it means therefore that it might not be so. But, you know, there are so many things in life that, you know, of which we don't have the hard evidence or for which we don't have the hard evidence, right? Lots of things that we could see. But sometimes also we have to trust our intuition and we have to look at patterns and trends. That's what I want to say. We must be able to examine the patterns, the trends, to see if they add up. And if they're adding up, then we have to make a decision. And that is how humans intelligent, you know, humans function. We cannot just simply depend on hard evidence to say that, oh, until we see that, then we are not going to make, um, we think that it doesn't exist, All right? Because so many things in our world, we can't see what we do know exist, right? And I guess love is one of them, right? <laughs> now, but we live on hope. Let's finish up the article. So it is not impossible that having Donald Trump's finger on the nuclear button might force a revival of the kind of serious national debate on the United States role in the world that we stopped having over a century ago. Now, remember that this article was written in 2017 during the administration of Donald Trump. So it's not now. That's why, you know, it's talking about his, um, you know, the possibility of his using the nuclear, pushing the nuclear button. Now, Donald Trump was a loose cannon, as we all know, right? And um, he would speak frankly about what the U.S. military was doing around the world. And he was not particularly diplomatic. He wasn't politically correct, as most U.S. politicians have to be to protect the interest of the military industrial complex. You cannot just go and, 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 you know, and talk anything. You have to be careful in what you say. Obama is a master of what, you know, it means to be careful in speech, 
right? He speaks enough and speaks eloquently. Um, and people think that he is saying a lot, but there is so much that he is not saying. Um, on the other hand, Donald Trump is often, you know, um, says a lot of things that the people in the military industrial complex would rather him not divulge. And uh, I think it's not that they probably hate his narcissism because the military and the military industrial complex, how can they not be narcissists? They have to be narcissists, right? The fact that they're, they want to control the entire globe and they are killing people and you know, they only want their, their agenda. They do not want to engage the populace. You know, it's all about control and you know and self-aggrandizement right so when we talk about trump being a narcissist which the papers all the press and you know the media american media all say i, I don't think only american media the international media they all say he is narcissistic which he is but you know the u.s military industrial complex um the, the people who, who operate that complex are also narcissists, right? They are also narcissistic. So we cannot blame Donald Trump alone for being a narcissist. Now, um, I think this is, you know, all I have to say tonight. I just wanted to point out some of the, the points that was raised in the article. And I hope that you have gathered something from it, you've learned something from it. And it causes you to rethink some of your position. You need to understand that no party system, the political system that we have in the world, including in the US, is not going to solve the problems at this time. And that there is no distinct difference between these two parties, these two parties run, they work for forces, the powerful forces that you and I are not able to see. But what we can see is that our, our you know, interests are often ignored and our needs are not taken care of in some cases. And I think that we must be able to come to grips with these realities, right? Because things are not going to get better, right? Things are going to get gradually worse. And this is not about, you know, um, being paranoid. Sometimes people say, you know, you're paranoid about what is happening, but it's about educating ourselves. So when we come up on these roadblocks, we know what decisions to make because, you know, Things are going to move so rapidly that if you are not aware of some of the things that we're talking about right now, how will you be able to discern what's going on? Right? Because if you never thought, for example, that the U.S. is has the potential of morphing into a military dictatorship, when it does, if it ever does, you know, um, which I believe one day it will, how are you going to survive? And I think mental survival is far more important than perhaps even physical survival. Because you, your mind is protecting, you were expecting that this might happen. And I think it's going to happen in a worse form than we are even anticipating. Because this is, as you know, the, the article mentioned, this is a very gigantic, it's a gigantic, humongous um, imperial. And they have powerful weapons at their disposal that they can be uh, used to inflict um, damage and harm on people. So I think I'm going to stop here for today. Um, thank you for listening to my boring speech, my boring discussion. Hope that you enjoyed it, even though um, it might not necessarily have been the traditional thing 
or my ap approach to my conversation. But I hope you enjoyed the, the discussion tonight. And I look forward to sharing another video with you um, another time. Thank you so much for joining. Bye.